Good morning, and I'm very happy to welcome you all to the Adler study in New York City and to the first panel of Steering Toward the Omega Point, a discussion on evolution, consciousness, and altruism. I'm Yanni Maniatis from the Interspiritual Spirituality Network and also from Forum 21. And Dr. David Sloan Wilson, uh, author of Does Altruism Exist, uh, will give us a short framing introduction shortly. But first, I'd like to introduce the panel. And by the way, all the bios of the panel will be on the website. Dr. Wilson is the distinguished SUNY Professor of Biology and Anthropology at Binghamton University, and also the Arnie Ness Chair in Global Justice and the Environment at the University of Oslo in Norway. And then next to him is Dr. Kurt Johnson, an evolutionary biologist and co-founder of the Interspiritual Network. Next to him is Gaston Meskins, who is at Ghent University Center for Ethical Ethics and Value Inquiry and on the Faculty of Arts, Philosophy, and Global Governance. Next to him is Doc, Reverend Dr. Diane Burke, founder of the One Spirit Interfaith Seminary. Next to her is Dina Merriam, convener of the Global Peace Initiative of Women and the Contemplative Alliance. Next to her is Tanya Andreyeshich Wexler, founder of Our Humanity Matters. And then next to her is Mitchell J. Raven, host and producer of A Better World Radio and TV, and he's also a holistic psychotherapist. So the panel, in order to understand our, what we'll be doing here today, has been offered three questions. And one is about the framing of the importance of altruism, Secondly, the process of evolutionary design principles for global change. And then lastly, questions with regard to the global emergence of heart intelligence. And so Dr. Wilson will now open our discussion with a five or six minute framing introduction. Okay, great. Well, thank you uh, very much. Uh, thanks everyone for coming. And there's gonna be three panels today. I think what brings us all together, the common ground that brings <coughs> us all together um, is an awareness that everything is interconnected. And this awareness, can, uh, we can arrive at it from many directions, sometimes from a religious and spiritual uh, uh, direction, sometimes from a humanist philosophical direction, sometimes from a scientific uh, direction. And I think that's amply reflected in the composition of the people that come here uh, today. We're occupying a common intellectual space, but how we came to that space is highly uh, diverse. And certain ethical conclusions follow from this awareness, namely that when you really think systemically, it becomes difficult to defend one part of the system against another part of the system. And so it leads to a holistic ethics, basically, which is all-embracing. And uh, this is very friendly to the spiritual um, and religious imagination. And uh, actually not so friend, well, I should say friendly to some scientific perspectives. Until recently, not so friendly from an evolutionary perspective. And there's an interesting divide that the people that are thinking holistically really gravitate towards ecology and evolution. It's in all of their titles. And, uh, and the vision of evolution is typically uh, close to what uh, Teilhard de Chardin uh, thought of something that's progressive and leads to some kind of global uh, consciousness and, and, uh, and unity. Uh, the ecological vision is very close to the Gaia hypothesis of James Lovelock, that in some sense the Earth can function as a single organism. And uh, until recently, um, uh, evolutionary science and uh, ecological science uh, actually was not all that favorable to that holistic view. Uh, it was too reductionistic for that, and also uh, in uh, sort of Dawkins' selfish gene language, it really seemed to explain selfishness much better than altruism. And all of that has changed over the last few decades, and what my book represents is a report on what's been happening in evolutionary science during the last few decades, which is much more favorable to the holistic worldview um, um, than it has been uh, previously. As Kurt has put it uh, poetically numerous times, 
it's like swimming downstream rather than upstream, basically. And uh, so I was offered the opportunity to write a short book on this, uh, on this topic. And uh, these people have, uh, have generously offered their time to read it and to reflect upon it from their, uh, from their uh, variety of perspectives. And so what an interesting day we're going to have combining this, uh, this uh, uh, diversity with this, uh, with this unity. And I think that it's not just going to be a love fest. Um, I think we're all kind of on the same page in some ways, but there's lots of interesting fundamental issues to uh, work out. And uh, one thing that you need to know about evolution is it doesn't make everything nice. Even if you wait a long time, it's not going to wait everything, make everything <laughs> nice. And so the title of our workshop, Steering Towards the Omega Point, I think is a very important signifier of that. What it means is, is that yes, it is possible to reach an Omega Point of sorts. That's the good news. The bad news is, is that it is by no means inevitable. And so unless we're smart, and if we know what we're doing, then we will not reach the Omega Point. We will reach a dystopia, not a utopia. Mm -hmm. And so that's why we have to become wise stewards of evolutionary processes, as I put it in my book. OK, so let's begin. Thank you, Dr. Wilson. Uh, each panelist will now speak for five minutes. And we'd like to begin with uh, Dr. Kurt Johnson. All right, so this is a really diverse conversation. And so my take is not to really set a direction, but to really kind of report on what my take on this is. And my take comes from really my two backgrounds in training, and one is in comparative religion and comparative mysticism, and the other one is in, in evolutionary biology. Now, speaking from the first one, that actually boils down to what David and I have called the two plus two equals four moment when we started working together and collaborating. And that two plus two equals four, which he just kind of referred to, was very simple, that the vision of the world's interfaith movements, interspiritual movements, and holistic movements on the sacred side of experience, if we want to use that term, were completely in sync with the evolutionary view of moving beyond the selfish gene and toward selection for altruism in group and multi-level selection, and that we were working for the same vision, and that was to create processes and structures that serve the whole and the global commons and not just necessarily the parochial interests of, uh, of uh, self-interest groups. Now, in the world religions, what that really means, growing from interfaith to inner spirituality, is the willingness, as we continue to evolve into a global civilization, to back burner dogmas, creeds, and potentially dangerous conflicting claims about reality, and instead move to the values that we all hold in common, the values, the ideals, and the ethics that are at the, at, the, at the root of all of these traditions. And that would include humanism, where we sit today. Felix Adler's own book, which founded American humanism, was entitled The Reconstruction of the Spiritual Ideal, in that direction. So specifically then, what we would observe is that it would be an absolute tragedy on planet Earth if we ended up annihilating each other just based on conflicting ideas. If we visited another planet, we would have that critique of them if they were doing that. We would see, oh my gosh, it's not so much about what they're believing or thinking, it's that they're willing to annihilate each other about that. So that would be kind of like a soft statement of where inner spirituality would say the world's religion should, should go. Actually, a more radical statement would be to say that as our spirituality matures, we would actually recognize any need to have an exclusive claim that set off one group against another was really a spiritual pathology. That if you looked at it anthropologically in the sense of its adaptive trait, you know, that ability to put that down and actually go to the other place would have a higher adaptive value than the value of the conflict, which, uh, which doesn't have that value. So that would be a radical statement. Now, on the evolutionary biology side, then it's very similar. Because ever since Darwin and Huxley, there was obviously a hijacking of the mechanics of evolution to this idea of survival of the fittest, the shark tank environment, whoever <coughs> dies with the most wins, you know, go through that whole thing. That was also at the time of the Industrial Revolution, as you'll remember. So those things were, you know, they were evolving along parallel tracks. So social Darwinism actually then became the default setting in the Western societies for how we understood the meaning of uh, the Darwinian message. 
And as David said, that's only started to uh, recently change. Now, the result of that then, for any of us who found ourselves existentially as activists trying to work toward holistic change, as David again said, our feeling was, if we looked at the science, we were actually swimming upstream against a cruel, uncaring, and just blind evolutionary system, which didn't seem to have anything in common with the urgencies of the heart. Now, what's interesting then, once altruistic evolution comes along, and, here the, and what's great about it, it's not driven by ideas, it's driven by the data. And the data is saying, hey, yeah, you've got the selfish gene operating within populations and selecting for those traits. But once you have groups and once you have selection between and among groups, which is what group selection and multi-level selection is about, then the rules change. And then it's about altruism and what structures and processes actually serve the whole. Now, that, from the scientific point of view, just as a data set, which is what drives science, that's a revolution. That's an absolute revolution. And that's what makes this discussion and this moment so different in recognizing this convergence that's going on. So the pinnacle of that is, just in my last minute here, is what David points out is that when we get to cultural evolution, we realize that it's about conscious choice. When we're talking about a sentient organism like Homo sapiens, where we go with cultural evolution is a matter of conscious choice. And, as he points out, if we're not aware of that, the process itself can take us actually, you know, somewhere uh, that we don't uh, maybe necessarily want to go. So that convergence is really what brings us all here. It's what's brought our work together, the roundtables that we're publishing and so on. And so that kicks off, as they say, my two cents. So thank you. <laughs> Next, we'll have uh, Gaston Meskins. Thank you. What does it mean to live in a complex world? Um, I've contributed a paper to this discussion uh, that tries to link ethics with uh, a fair dealing with complexity. So if you look at complex social problems, such as climate change or poverty, um, then we can say that, very, very brief, that they are all troubled by knowledge-related uncertainty and value pluralism, which means that actually nobody has the authority, the absolute authority to make sense of them. No scientific theories, no religious views, no political ideologies, no cultural views and so on, which means in practice that we have no reference other than each other to make sense of them. Okay, so if the world is complex, then the central question of my view on ethics would be what would it imply to fairly deal with that complexity? And I developed this ethical attitudes of reflexivity and intellectual solidarity as proposed ethical attitudes to fairly deal with the complexity that really binds us. Intellectual solidarity can, see, can be seen very simple as our preparedness to leave the comfort zones we construct around our simplified rationals we use to defend our interests. But that's, there is more. Viewing the world as complex is not a choice. The complexity is a fact. If you, for instance, buy a cheap t-shirt that is made in a sweatshop in Bangladesh, then it's not simply, you cannot really solve this, the problem by refraining from buying the t-shirt. The person making the t-shirt in a sweatshop in Bangladesh, and you as a customer, you are bound in complexity, in a complex system. So I developed this idea that our modern world is really characterized by, by three, actually three new characteristics. It's connectedness, it's vulnerability, and it's a sense of engagement. Connectedness is simply the idea that we are connected with each other in complexity. We cannot any longer escape or avoid it. So fair dealing with each other implies fair dealing with the complexity that binds us. Vulnerability, very brief. In complexity, we became intellectually dependent on each other while we face our own and each other's authority problem. Sense of engagement, our experiences as human beings now extend from the local to the global. And as intelli intelligent, reflective beings, becoming involved in deliberating issues of general societal concern became, I think, I believe, a new source of meaning and moral motivation for each one of us. So as citizens, we want to enjoy the right to be responsible in the complexity that binds us, although not only in our own interests, 
I think for contemporary humans, the will to contribute to making sense of the complexity of our coexistence can be understood as driven by an intellectual need and actually as a form of intellectual altruism. We don't do it for ourselves. We want to contribute to making sense of the complexity that binds us. So that was be very short, my answer to the first question. For the second question, um, in his writings on ethics, the pragmatist philosopher John Dewey developed the argument that our social well-being depends above all on the widest possible currency of democratic habits. So for De Dewey, democracy equals social intelligence. And he considered it the moral responsibility of the architects of democratic methods to liberate and use the social intelligence present in our society to the maximum extent. So um, in the language of Eleanor Ostrom, our joint social intelligence can be considered as a common pooled resource. Especially taking into account that intellectual solidarity, as I see it, requires us to acknowledge that the fact that we have no reference other than each other, and that this fact is not limiting, but liberating. Third question. My proposed ethical attitudes of, or virtues of reflexivity and intellectual solidarity require as much in the intellectual intelligence as hard intelligence, so to speak, to use the phrasings of the uh, third question. So in my text, I have stressed that reflexivity as ethical attitude or virtue should not be understood as a psychological state of being of concerned individuals. They are really fostered as an ethical experience. And last but not least, in that sense, as uh, David Sloan Wilson puts it, our human capacity of symbolic thought that can be transmitted across generations, including but not restricted to language, led to a quantum jump in our ability to adapt to our current environment. I find that a very strong idea. And my basic message in related, to, related to that here is that I think symbolic thought that at first sight does not seem to fulfill a direct practical purpose for our social organization, being philosophy, spiritual thought, surrealism, art, poetry, fantasy, should not be restricted to the practices of art and culture alone. It fulfills as much a role in our goal-directed interactions in politics, science, and education as the more rational forms of thought, and should therefore be fostered in advanced methods of education, research, and political decision-making. Thank you. Thank you, Gaston. And now we'll have Reverend Dr. Diane Byrne. Good morning. The perspectives that I bring to the conversation are as an interfaith, interspiritual educator, and also as a psychologist and student of human development. And from those perspectives, as I read David's work, there were really two questions that became primary for me. The first is, can the world's religions and spiritual traditions actually play a beneficial role in helping to bring about what David calls a planetary altruism? Certainly so much of what we see around the world now is religions playing a very destructive role in what uh, may or may not be the future of humanity, but can they actually play a beneficial role? And the second question is, what do developmental theories uh, of human development and psychological development and maturation have to offer uh, to that question? Starting with the second question, one thing that's quite interesting is that among the multitude of developmental theories that exist, in pretty much all of them, you find that the development of worldview, the development of identity, the development of consciousness, of identity, move through some stages that can be recognized in, in all of these different developmental theories. They all begin with uh, a stage at the development of the self that is referred to as egocentric, 
where the identity and the area of primary concern is with the individual self and its well-being and its interests. From there, development moves to a level that is described as ethnocentric, and at that level of worldview and identification, the primary concern is with the well-being of my group, however that group is defined, whether that's by religion, by geography, by ethnicity, but the concern is with the well-being of my group. So in a sense, the movement in uh, the capacity to take increasing perspectives moves simply from me to we. The next level of development is what is referred to as world-centric, and there the level of identification is with humanity as a whole and the well-being of humanity as a whole. From there, there is uh, now recognized the emergence of a level of development that is referred to as cosmocentric where the concern and uh, primary identification is with life as a whole, or with the living universe as a whole. So in a sense, the developmental progression moves from primary focus and concern from me to we to all of us to all of life. If we look at the state of religion in the world today, and not just religion, but, but culture in general, the predominant level of identification is ethnocentric. And that's what we see erupting in uh, religious division, religious conflict, particularly as expressed in fundamentalistic uh, orientations. But the reality is also that within every tradition, there is an expression of each one of those primary levels of identification so that each religion contains the potential to help uh, adherents of that tradition develop in their own consciousness and their own maturation from egocentric to ethnocentric to world-centric to cosmocentric. And in that sense, religions do have the capacity to contribute, uh, as Ken Wilber would describe it, the function of being a conveyor belt of consciousness to the highest levels of identification that make planetary altruism possible. Thank you. Thank you, Diane. And now, uh, Dina Mary. Good morning. Um, is it on? Yes. <coughs> it is on. Um, well, I speak from a different, slightly different perspective. My background is in the Vedic sciences. So I'll speak from, from, from that point of view. In the Vedic worldview, evolution is about the evolution of consciousness. And evolution of consciousness drives biological evolution. And major steps take place when there is a need, when conditions arise that call for this. And so there was a need in the progression of things for greater individuation. And so that took place and it now reached its excess. And there's a need now to strengthen the altruism gene. So that is in the process of taking place. But according to the Vedic worldview, evolution is not linear, it's a spiral. There are cycles within that. So we go through higher times when the consciousness is at a more elevated level and there's a greater functioning from the collective and then times when that consciousness is lost. Fortunately, we're, an, we're at the beginning of an upward spiral. So this is good news for, for all of us. Um, I want to address a few of the, the other questions, which is about moving from um, intellectual intelligence to heart intelligence. I would use another word, intuitive intelligence. And, and in the higher ages, it's the intuitive intelligence that predominates. The rational intelligence is guided by the intuitive intelligence. And this intuitive intelligence has been repressed 
in the last few millennium, which is now beginning to emerge again. Um, the, the, in, the, in the Vedic uh, tradition, there are practices that help speed evolution, spiritual practices, and it's true in all the religious traditions. I think our challenge now is the speed of evolution because there is, there is a need for a shift to happen within a rel relatively short period of time. Evolution takes place over millennia, but we don't have millennia. We have decades. So I think that's why we're seeing a spread of spiritual practices and um, you know, the, the, there's the interspiritual movement is helping to bring together the religious tradition. So while you see the negatives of religious excesses, you also see the positives of greater convergence and, and people bring, joining spiritual practices because there is an unconscious n understanding that evolution needs to be speeded up. Evolution of consciousness needs to be sp speeded up. Um, so, and I think also because it's a spiral and one higher age is, is more advanced than the last higher age or different, I, I think it, we're at the stage now when we can have a more conscious evolution, where evolution can be guided. It's not just happening. We can take, uh, play a role in, in, in um, hastening this process. So that's where I hope we can direct our, um, our energies. And I think the, the whole uh, um, understanding of altruism, just putting it into the collective consciousness, is part of the process of offsetting or, or, or um, kind of capping this excessive individualism, which has helped society advance to the point it is now, but it's now become a destructive quality and needs to be um, shifted into, into something else. So that's my understanding of where we are. I would like to talk about how um, evolution, consciousness, and altruism is reflected in media. The way I see it, uh, media supporting our consciousness, evolution, and also the way I see it could even further support the collective shift. <coughs> As we all know, humanity is a turning point. Our technological times had created devastating impact on our environment on which we depend on, and at the same time, mass media, at least some aspect, larger aspects of mass media, is furthering, further uh, separating us from the natural environment and shaping the way we see the reality. And we are humans only in the contact with the non-human world and with each other. And on the other hand, media is also presenting us with the awareness of global issues, environmental, social, and so on. So it's helping us see our actions on a larger scale and, of, and in the larger context which we are intricate part of and are, are helping us see our self-image and giving us opportunity to shift from selfish single-minded driven agendas into more understanding of who we are as a human beings and uh, what is our purpose and understanding the only collaboration, altruism, harmony and respect for all forms of life will bring us a secure future. So it ha it's helping us humanity to be called to a question, who are we? What is our relationship to the whole? what is our responsibility to the whole, and what is our purpose. I see media as manifestation of already pre-existing pre uh, networks of love and interconnectivity that already existed. Our, our need to know more about each other and of all forms of life. And I feel that we created media because of that urge to understand and it was part of manifestation of a higher consciousness. I see it as a hologram or global brain in which all of our pathologies and our spiritual level and of our intellectual and emotional levels are projected. 
those media has been largely used now for selfish agendas by corporations. I see now a big shift in the way we are using media and uh, forming alliances and networks that support altruistic agenda and they serve the whole and not just a few. So when I was reading the book, Does Altruism Exist?, I realized, realized that similar processes that are happening in nature uh, are happening now also in media, driving for the higher complexity, building networks and missions that supports the whole and working for everybody, and that they're grounded on principle of ethics and values and many are consciously pursuing higher consciousness to create a global shift for humans to evolve to a higher level. And those networks are also based on heart intelligence and love, which, which will serve us as a compass while navigating through challenges by transforming our <coughs> values. That altruism is a part of ethic and consciousness and the fundamental fabric of the larger intelligence and is therefore stronger when working together. So therefore, altruistic tendency for collaboration, caring, connection, and love are revolutionary manifestation of a higher power. I saw like the altruism is also not just a result of evolution driving for a higher complexity, but since we saw the devastating results of our actions, it's also part of evolution that is adaptation. We need altruism more than ever in order for us to survive. Good morning, everyone. <clears throat> I've been inspired in listening to everyone speak, and I was thinking that I wanted to start a movement. We've all heard of AI, artificial intelligence. Well, I would like to start one called AE, Accelerated Evolution. It seems that that is the place we need to go as we listen to everybody here, and we understand that we are sitting on this precipice between what we could call the sixth extinction or the sixth epoch where we uh, thrive. Like David spoke earlier about uh, a utopia or a dystopia that we might be heading toward. Well, I'm one for utopia. So I think that we have the evolutionary imprint for that to occur. Uh, I believe personally as a belief that it's genetic, I can't prove it. I'm not a geneticist or anything of that sort. But I do have access, as we all do, to something very fundamental that Joseph Campbell talked about when he spoke of this impulse, I will call it a, a psychobiological impulse, where when two people are standing on a street in New York City and they don't know each other formally, but a bus comes right down the street very quickly and one doesn't see it and starts to step into the street, the other will risk his or her life to grab that other person and bring them back. This is a very interesting aspect of our psyche and our biology. And in that one moment, I feel so much is communicated about our true human nature and our evolutionary potential. I'd like to also just take a moment and say that with the work I do as a holistic psychotherapist, I'm always dealing with the integration of mind and body, not to mention heart and soul. And in that work, I often ask my clients to step out of the ordinary realm and just simply feel their own center, their own ground, their feet on, their, on the ground, and their butt on the cushion. And by moving away from our ordinary mentalized self and coming into our physical selves, we become aware of the feelings we have and we become aware of the sensations and then therefore also the impulses toward what we're calling here altruism. We have a way of empathizing with each other. What is that about? What does that mean from an evolutionary point of view? I think it's very interesting. It means that we can feel and experience each other. Granted, it engages the imagination, which I think is God's greatest gift anyway. And we can imagine 
or as they like to say these days, reimagine a different kind of future. And I think that gives us the possibility of a kind of future that if we allow the ordinary machinations of mind to rule us, we might be heading more toward that sixth extinction instead of epoch. So with that said, I want to also just take a look, as I like to do, at sort of the neuropsychology or brain development. And I sometimes look at our culture today. I don't like using the word civilization because I don't see enough civilized behavior between people, but I think that we're growing toward it. We're so, in so many ways, working out of our reptilian brain, which, by the way, is cold-blooded. Have you ever met a warm, friendly reptile? I don't think so. But we have the mammalian brain, which is all about love, the mammary glands, nurturing. And then, of course, we have you know, the great crowning effect of the uh, cerebral cortex. And I believe that as we're growing, we can integrate all of these in a holistic fashion, use the wisdom and intelligence of each, so we can become a whole-brained, whole-hearted, coherently operating human being in collective to create more cooperation, which I think is probably the most intelligent, that in love, adaptation, biodiverse adaptation to our current society, situation, all the issues with which we are dealing, and gives us a potential for a whole beautiful future world. Thank you. Thank you, Mitchell, and thank you one of you panelists for an excellent uh, discussion here. And we're going to turn it over now to Dr. Wilson. You do not have five minutes for yourself? Uh, no, they're your five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're the one who gets yeah, them. Uh, okay. So, uh, and so you will just, um, it'll be an opportunity now for the panelists to ask each other questions and or to ask uh, Dr. Wilson questions. So whoever would like to, it'll be popcorn-like, and whoever wants to pop up first here. Uh, with any questions again for each other? Or I would like to, I'm, I'm uh, supposed to play the role of moderator here, so I'd uh, like to get the ball rolling. My own comments are going to be take place at the end, but uh, I have a question I'd like to uh, ask everyone, which is that if you look at a single religious or spiritual tradition, uh, what you find is often they're very good at creating meaning and community at a certain scale. And uh, the problem, of course, is that scale is not large enough. And so the problem is to expand the scale. And one way to expand the scale is to become more ecumenical, basically. Inner spirituality is a blending of all these uh, traditions. And my question is, will that work? Because will a, a diversity of traditions, can a diversity of traditions be as strong uh, in terms of providing a meaning system and resulting in community as a single meaning system. So does inter-spirituality work from a spiritual uh, perspective and also from a community perspective is my, is my question to all of you. I'd like to make a comment. Uh, I don't think we want to get rid of our, our religious diversity just like we don't want to get rid of our um, biodiversity and cultural diversity. That, that is the beauty mm -hmm. of human society is it's, it's rich diversity and there, there are uh, different languages and metaphors and ways to describe very similar phenomenon. So I see interspirituality is coming to understand the other and appreciate the other without losing the unique uh, beauty of one's own tradition. Thank you. No, I totally agree. I mean, this is one of the long discussions in interspirituality is this word blend. And the, the quantum reality is not about blend. The quantum reality is how very different things are fine with each other, welcome each other, and create wonderful things in their multiplicity of synergy. So as our species gets more understanding, that kind of entanglement gives us the skill then to have the roots and the wisdom and the integrity of every tradition, and then also what it means to have all of those, as what Wayne Teasdale said, resources on the table. So it's, the unity doesn't need to be unison. So. 
And I, I agree completely with what both Dina and Kurt said. Um, I remember at one particular gathering, uh, interspiritual gathering, one of the participants uh, was an imam. And what he shared with us was religiously and culturally, I feel most at home in my mosque and in my durga. Spiritually, I feel most at home here. Oh. And I think that that again goes to uh, the level of unitive experience as opposed to the level of narrative or dogma or belief. That, um, that each of the traditions arose out of some kind of direct experience that was then uh, taught and uh, understood by the people of that time within the limitations of their own uh, consciousness development. But that that ground of experience, of unitive experience, really lies at the foundation of every tradition. It's no longer what is emphasized in the practice of religion, but it really is the foundation of each of them. And so there is a level of community that I think we would call cosmocentric, the mystical level of unity that practitioners of different religions experience through their practices and that we can share the, uh, the rich heritage of practices that have been developed to tap back into that direct experience rather than worrying about whether the stories we tell about that experience match up or don't. Great, thank you. I think if, if we want to strive to what we could call one common system or framework of understanding, I think it should be inspired by a, what I would call an ethics of resignation. Um, and that would also not, uh, not only include uh, different religious or spiritual views, but also science. Um, I'm, a, okay, I'm now here as a philosopher, but I'm a theoretical physicist by education. I'm a cosmologist. And I remember um, back at university, there were really people who believed that, I mean, these mathematical formulas representing the theory of the Big Bang represent a truth. But I'm probably one of the few uh, cosmologists who believes that we will never get the real answer, neither from a religious point of view, neither from a scientific point of view, where it all comes from. But then what I would call this ethics of resignation, or you call it some kind of pragmatist ethics, would inspire us uh, with the insight that we don't need the answer to make this world a better place for all. We don't need it. And really um, being prepared to give up that quest for a truth to really defend your own interests would be this, um, the central point of this ethics of resignation. We don't need it. If I could uh, just insert quickly, uh, uh, you mentioned John Dewey. And, um, and uh, I think it's ironic that when people think of social Darwinism, they think of only the negative applications. And yet we get people like John Dewey, who was profoundly influenced by evolution and had very positive um, applications. So that's a, a brief aside. In, in, uh, if I can add to that, in, uh, in European um, intellectual thought, also from time to time in the media, uh, the creationism versus Darwinism discussion uh, pops up uh, once in a while. But I think it's a false discussion. And even from a scientific point of view, nobody's saying it's a false discussion. I mean, Darwin never said where it all comes from. He said how we evolve. So, and, and I see some kind of scientific fundamentalism standing up against religious fundamentalism, a new co form of positivism that is also um, ruining, actually, intellectual debate as much as religious fundamentalism is doing today. Yeah, thank you. Uh, uh, Mitchell. Uh, I'm going to make a quick comment just before because it's important. Uh, Deepak Chopra now, every year at Science and Non-Duality Conference, gives his report on the holistic science and where it's going. 
And he ends up with the same type of metaphor that what we're going to end up with is the department store mirror that has eight facets and you see the dress or you see the suit from eight different angles and it's not a fight over which of those views is accurate. They're all different views of the same thing. So that's where they think even the quantum discussion is going. Thank you. I, just to say in quick response to what you posed here, David, uh, thinking that there's some kind of unitive perspective that we should all be embracing at the expense of a biodiverse one is sort of like uh, courting the dangers of monocropping. You end up with one crop, probably GMO'd corn, and uh, at the expense of whole-bodied nutrition. So in a, a quick phrase, but I'd also just say that, uh, yeah, I feel like the whole domain of biomimicry and understanding ourselves from observing nature, because of course we're always thinking of nature as outside ourselves, which is you know just one of those cosmic jokes. But when we really look and quiet down, we see that of course we are nature herself. And so our biodiversity leads to our adaptation to uh, you know a life of joy and I think we're learning more and more through neuroscience evolutionary biology that the qualities of cooperation of love of of even smiling the physiology of a smile of laughter of joy of giving sets off an entire uh, volume of chemicals into our blood. It reduces cortisol levels. It reduces aggression. It builds our immune function. Everything changes when we are feeling love, affection, affinity with each other and for each other. And to me, that is really the evolutionary pivot, which brings us into uh, another kind of uh, better world, new reality. Great, yes, and then I'd like to uh, uh, start a new direction, but please. Um, I wouldn't advocate giving up the quest for truth. I don't think that's possible. I think that's just built into our DNA. But I would say great humility in knowing that, uh, that we, cannot, um, we cannot express or even uh, conceptualize the nature of ultimate reality. I do believe it can be experienced but not articulated or conceptualized. And that's why the mystics of old traditions seek the experience and don't get into theological discussion. All right, and humility is a virtue for science in addition to uh, religion and, um, and uh, spirituality, and, uh, something that scientists don't always uh, um, uh, take on. And I think that one of the exciting things about this whole conversation is how it includes not just the whole religious and spiritual traditions, but also the environmental traditions, and that to come at this awareness that everything is interconnected from an environmental direction, uh, as Arne Ness did, the Norwegian philosopher with his deep ecology, uh, is uh, you could really appreciate why environmentalists have that strong spiritual streak, even if they don't come from any religious uh, uh, traditions, and I think that is the reason. I'd like to turn the uh, conversation to two things that, uh, that uh, is reflected in your comments. One was uh, complexity, and the other is the speed of evolution. And if you look at how adaptive complexity evolves in nature, it is by a process of selection uh, at the systemic level. So whether that's an, uh, an organism or a bee colony, it's always uh, basically the systems, the complex systems that work well <laughs> are being selected and the ones that don't work well are not among the ancestors. Now, that is true to a remarkable degree for human cultures. The more we actually think about cultural evolution, human cultural evolution, as an evolutionary process, then we realize that our cultures today, all cultures, religious and otherwise, are basically products of selection, uh, group level selection, and nobody designed them. Nobody designed them. They're, they're complex, they're adaptive, at least to a degree, and nobody design them, but that is a very slow process, as has been pointed out, and we cannot, it, it must be accelerated. And how to do that, how to be more mindful about evolving the future is very difficult, because we know that two things don't work. One is centralized planning, doesn't work. <laughs> the other is laissez-faire, doesn't work. And so what is the middle ground 
for evolving complex systems where you can't figure out the whole thing and create a big grand plan, and you can't just let everything take its course. There's something in between, and that is in part an economic conversation in addition to a, a, a spiritual and philosophical conversation, a point to which we'll return in some of our subsequent uh, panels. So your thoughts, please, or more thoughts, please, on this combination of, of uh, complex systems and accelerating evolution. I'm just going to throw in just a phrase from Ken Wilbur. And actually, last year, David and I went out, and they got to sit down for a whole day. Uh, part of that conversation is on YouTube. It's been seen by 30,000 people. Um, but Ken says something I think is really important. He says, we have evolution driving toward complexity. But once it gets into the world of sentience, it, it then drives into inclusivity. Uh, and once you've driven it into inclusivity and you have that requirement, that's where this four-letter word love comes up. So to make the jump from complexity to inclusivity to love is a fairly easy jump to make when we understand that process. I think we, we would need to get over the what I would call the grams of modernity, the uh, traditional systems we have today uh, for our politics for science and for our markets. Um, these are uh, systems that we, that were, they're really the result of an emancipation process. Modernity as an emancipation process. But um, they are still basically uh, driven by, um, it's, ci it's civilized ways to deal with conflict and truth still. And we would need to get over that. And um, it is, um, this, this idea of liberating uh, what I would call my intellectual solidarity uh, thing, uh, really, we need advanced approaches to democracy, science, and education for that. Uh, because today, it is uh, what I would call this uh, intellectual altruism, the really the, the motivation for every human being to have the right to be responsible and do something with that, uh, to contribute to making sense of complexity, is today, it's, it's not really, it's, 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 un it's locked into the traditional methods of uh, politics, science, and education. And it should be unlocked in, in advanced governance methods. Um, the idea of deliberative democracy in that sense is very valuable. The idea of pluralist self-critical education, the idea of transdisciplinary and, and inclusive science in that sense. So going to advanced methods of making sense of the world, that doesn't mean that it, it will become a flat world. On the contrary, it would really do justice to all kinds of opinions even religious and spiritual opinions that, that, and they would not need to really prove their stake is true. So it would really open up the possibility for all kinds of opinions to be taken serious in that sense. I, I would say um, balancing the rational intelligence with intuitive intelligence. And the, there are practices to cultivate intuitive intelligence. The right practice of meditation is one of the most common ways of speeding of evolution because it changes consciousness. I mean, that's, that's all the Dalai Lama's scientific work shows that it changes patterns in the brain, brain. It carves new channels in the brain. But it's not just the stress reduction five minute meditation, it's the serious practice that actually regrooves the brain and changes consciousness. And, and that's why so many people are focusing on this now because there is the understanding of the need for a shift, a collective shift, and various, various forms, all traditions have this of meditation, um, do this, they, pro they produce this shift in consciousness. Mitchell. I appreciate that point very much. When I was about 21, for whatever reason, even though I was born Jewish, I wasn't very into it, uh, but I began to contemplate the Messiah and what that might mean. And uh, of course, Moshiach in Hebrew means king. Uh, but I thought, you know, what I think Messiah really means here is the awakening of collective consciousness. And in other words, we're all going to be kinged or queened. And uh, that's going to be the new shift in consciousness that brings us to a next evolutionary level. I didn't have all that lingo back then, but some of it. Uh, but I'll tell you, I want to go back to biomimicry and say something that might sound revolutionary, but I believe it's evolutionary. When we look at bees, since you mentioned that, David, I think it's uh, actually very appropriate and synchronistic. Uh, we, we want to look at, um, we see the queen bee. It's very interesting. 
democracy, I think, has been shown actually not to work, if we're very honest about it. It's not working for lots of reasons. It's worth discussing. But the queen bee model seems to be working for, oh, I don't know, a few million years. I'm not sure how old the bee population is, but it's a long time. I think that we would, we would, <laughs> it would behoove us to take a look at that as an option for leadership. We're looking at- Let me quickly ask you, what do you wh how would you describe the queen bee model? Because there, we're, we're, on, we're on the verge of a really cool conversation here, which can't take place because it'd be too long. But uh, elaborate on what you mean by what, what you, mean by the queen bee model? I'm going to have a little fun, if you don't mind, which is, number one, the queen, not king, uh, which, which harkens forward the idea of the feminine in a world that's overly masculine. Uh, it, it's a discussion. And we're looking at archetypes of leadership. And my understanding of the queen is that there are uh, delegated uh, roles for all to play in her society, but it is also led by, I'm gonna say, I'm gonna have some fun and say, by some level of compassion and love. And I don't know that, because I haven't <laughs> been a bee for a while, but uh, I think it's possible. And I think it's worth reflecting on and looking into. What's really interesting to reflect upon is, is so social forms that are so comparative that not only are we comparing human social forms, but we're comparing animal social forms. It might not go in exactly the same way that you envision, but it will be wonderful when it, when it takes place. It is already taking place, but it needs to take place among a much broader Larger circle. Population, Let, and consciously. Yeah. Thank you, we'll discuss this yeah. further. And I would just like to add that um, I think that one of the things that needs to happen is intentionally introducing images into the public psyche and the public conversation. I think media has a huge role to play with that, but I think of the time that the first images of Earth as a whole were sent back from space and that that really impelled uh, a consciousness shift where we had a visual image that entered the imagination of our interconnectedness at a whole other level. And I think in, in the same way that we talk about biodiversity, that within each of our respective fields, uh, we need to be introducing images that expand the inclusivity of the conversation and introduce new possibilities. And that there isn't a single way, as you said, it's not gonna be centralized planning. It's gonna be happening within each of the systems that we are participants in. Yeah, great. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. We unfortunately have this wonderful, engaging discussion. We have a time limit on it. We live in time and space, at least somewhat. Whether the question is to be or not to be, we'll find out. Uh, but at this point, I'd like to just leave it open for David to give his concluding remarks to this, and then we will have more panels and more discussions. Yes, how wonderful is it that we'll have two more of these panels in which we can continue these conversations in a cumulative fashion, and all of it will be captured uh, for a wider, uh, a wider audience. Well, this is a feast. And uh, there's so many points that I think uh, the, the main point I want to stress is how these philosophical points, what most people would identify as, as philosophical points, how they connect to the developments in evolutionary science that are uh, reported in my uh, book in a way that uh, no one would have imagined, I think, uh, um, uh, not so, not so um, um, uh, long ago. For example, the idea of consciousness steering evolution. I mean, no self-respecting evolutionary biologist would have signed <laughs> on to that um, other than Thiel de Chardin. Uh, no, there was a whole reductionistic swing that would make that inadmissible. But now, actually, it's back. And it's back in part because uh, although uh, uh, the, the simple process of evolution is not conscious, it's just a blind process of variation and selection, it does create sentient beings at various levels of sentience. And those beings then, actually, that feeds back to the evolutionary
process. And that's true not only for humans with their very sophisticated forms of, of uh, consciousness, but also uh, any creature capable of learning, basically, will, that will feed back uh, on the genetic evolutionary process. And uh, cultural evolution has been steering genetic evolution for our species uh, for a long, long uh, time, with cultural evolution leading the way. And that is now becoming the norm in thinking about it. So these are the sorts of things that are so uh, very fascinating. Uh, the concept that a religion and spirituality has a vertical dimension, which is your relationship with God or however conceived, and a horizontal dimension, uh, um, um, a, a person's relations with fellow uh, persons. Uh, this has a powerful connection to the evolutionary distinction between proximate and ultimate causation. If that's a weird terms for you, then that's why the conversation needs to uh, uh, needs to um, uh, continue. Um, stages, uh, speaking in terms of higher and lower stages, which is such a predominant part of the narrative, I think, as Dina was, uh, was talking about, and it comes up again and again in Wilbur's work and so on. I think this will be one of the most interesting intersections, very complex, but I want to suggest that instead of changes, to a degree we need to think about competing forms and that the lower stages are actually always in competition with the higher stages and can win the Darwinian struggle, basically, unless we configure the environment in the right, uh, in the right way so that the so-called higher stages, always the stages we hope will evolve, actually will evolve in some kind of a Darwinian struggle. Because one of the things that we're finding at all kinds of levels is that much of what we think of as pathological and is pathological is also adaptive in the evolutionary sense of the word. In other words, the people who are behaving that way, are they have to behave that way in the environment that they are in. Mm -hmm. And if you simply offer something that's higher or better or more empathetic, then that's not good enough because in that environment, then that higher form is not going to Evolve. So it comes down to an environmental intervention, basically. How do we create social environments so that the, so that the higher forms actually win the Darwinian um, uh, contest? Because it always is a Darwinian contest. That's why something like the media is quite capable of creating a global brain, but only if it's structured in the right way. And if not, then what's going to win the Darwinian contest in the media <laughs> is what we have, basically. And, um, and uh, another point to make about empathy, which uh, with Mitchell, among others, uh, raised, I think it's important to say that there's two sides to the morality coin. There's the empathetic side, and there's the coercive side, that uh, you, you, we all need to do the right thing. And if we don't, there will be consequences. So, uh, and so morality has two, there's two sides to the morality coin. And the reason that the coercive side is necessary is to protect the empathetic side. When the coercive side is in place, then it's safe to be an altruist, mm -hmm. basically. And then finally to end, I think, this idea that, uh, at which I end my book, is that we have to be planetary altruism. It's impossible to evolve a complex system without selecting at the level of the complex system. This is profoundly anti invisible hand. It is not the case that the lower level pursuit of self-interest robustly benefits the common good. If you want the common good to work well, you must select the systems at that level. And so therefore, we must be planetary altruists. That involves, uh, that involves a social environment that selects for it, but it also involves just being able to see the planet, as you just said. So there's, again, a vertical dimension to that, a psychological dimension, so that we're actually we're inspired to help the planet, and so we're mindfully selecting at that scale. But then there is the social environment that we have to put into place. You could call it the coercive side, so that if somebody doesn't do that, then that will not take over the uh, 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 field. So it's a very complex uh, process, but actually we do have a rough blueprint. And how exciting is that? Thank you. Thank you again, David, uh, for inspiring this and for the panelists. It's been an honor to be a part of this. Thank you.